so I'm going to do a refresher for Carmen while uh, the rest of the class is loading in. So Carmen, what you do is you got your art here, and I don't know how many layers you have, but uh, for each layer I have, you got to do it for each one. So you select one layer at a time, and this is also in the video tutorial from last class. Okay, so each layer, one at a time, you select it, then go to the menu up here at the top right, and then you go down to Release Layers Sequence. Okay, yep, yeah, so Release Layers Sequence, then every part that was inside that layer, you select, drag out of that layer, select the old empty layer, and delete it. You have to do that for every single layer. And then I always save a copy and just an AI file is fine. So that's you do that for every single step and you make sure it's RGB. And before you break it down, make sure your workspace is set to 1920 by 1080 so it stays in place. You can do that um, off the home page. They have the uh, 1920 by 1080 default template if you want to just copy and paste everything in there if you haven't already done it. So then once you've got your layers all sequenced out and you deleted all the old layers, in After Effects you go File, Import File, leave that up for a second, you only click once. You select the layer, I mean the file that has everything separated out, and then down here with Import As, go Composition Retain Layer Sizes, like that. Then you import it, then it makes pre-comp of everything and you can double click and work on it and don't forget these are your modes you click toggle switches and modes here's my switches you want to collapse transformations for every illustrator file you bring in so that it stays nice and crisp and it doesn't get blurry when you scale it up I turned off my alpha right there and it just shows it keeps everything like that so I can delete that layer All right, let's dive in to the new stuff. So, over here, I just broke out this character. Uh, you want to have rounded edges. Some of these aren't round, but you want to have rounded edges because it'll help hide where your layers meet up. So you got to break down everything, like I just showed you, uh, sequence it out, and then import it. And remember, the more layers you have, the more options and possibilities. But you see you have to also practice layer control. So here's everything, and then I brought it in to right here. So here's what it looked like when I brought it in, and I continuously rasterized all my layers. And then next, what we do is going to be parenting and adding nulls to these shapes. So I'm going to get to my notes. All right, so we cover the first one. Now something else I want to show you from the notes, I brought the image in. Think about your puppet. Uh, a lot of people do a straight on, a three quarter, a side, three quarter the other way, the other side, and you know, back views. This way, when you need to do like turns and moving, it helps fake that a little bit better. And if you're doing characters, you don't need to redo every single character. Like you can keep a variety of faces separate off of, I mean, I should say expressions, separate off of the face. So you have the least amount of parts that you've got to keep uh, in your workflow. And... This is an overview of character rigging. One second. This is an image of what you would see if you're working in a 3D software, but basically you're gonna have your head, your neck, the shoulders, uh, the midpoint of the chest, or I should say, yeah, the, the shoulders, midpoint of the chest, the middle of the chest, the hips, your legs, shoulders, elbow, forearm, wrist, hands, each where each one of these is is basically where you're going to put a puppet pin. 
So basically where your character is going to be moving is where the pins are going to be going. Now, before I go on to the next step, is everyone clear on that? Where the pins would need to go. And remember, when you're doing puppet pins, they're really good for uh, photos and images that have textures, whereas shape layers might be a faster way if you're going with a more uh, traditional look. I'm just showing you how to do this one with the which we'll call it the shapes. Okay, no questions so far. Good. But the way this works is you're going to need an expression to parent your puppet pins to a null. Sort of like how I showed you with the path. Um, I'll do a quick refresher on that. Uh, if you had your path points, we're going to make this no fill with a solid. Come on. Solid stroke. Yep. Okay. Point, point, point like that. And then I'm going to twirl down and open up the path. Select the path. And then go window. Create nulls from paths. And I'm going to want the points that I just made to follow the nulls. So I'm going to click this first one. And then I can animate this shape by moving around my nulls, which is a far easier workflow than trying to move the points around. And you could parent other things to this. Um, actually, I'm glad I opened this back up. This made me think of something uh, for Mason. If you're doing it this way with your character, one of the benefits of doing it this way. And I showed you before, you would animate the, the position of these nulls to move them around. But let me show you something. We didn't cover this last class, but we'll do it real fast here. Um, I'll make the world's greatest hand. There we go. That is the best hand you're going to see. So I hope you took notes on how I made it. Perfect. Okay. There's my hand, right? I'm going to line up right there. Check this out. I can, let me rename this. Hand. And the knoll, that would be the wrist, is right, is this is shoulder. This one's elbow. And I'm just hitting the enter key to rename them, and this is the wrist. Okay, so I can parent this by pick whipping from here or using the drop down menu. I'm going to just pick whip it like that and check this out. So before I showed you position, here's position and it's going to move along with it up and down. Yep, that's great. But watch what happens when I grab the elbow right here in the middle and I hit rotate. Nothing's going to happen. You see the null rotating. But this path point can't rotate. But check this out. See the hand? The hand is parented to this point. So if I rotate this point, you can now see the hand rotating based off the null, as well as moving when you keyframe the position. So that's going to help you out with some of your motion for your project, Carmen is if you pick things like hands and feet and parent them here, because then you can position, rotate them. Well, I mean, you can position, animate them as well as rotate them that way. Okay, so let me go back to my puppet. All right, so what I did, because there was a lot of layers, I made pre-comps. Like the various fingers, each finger on my puppet can be moved. And I parented all those, I mean pre-comp those into the hand. And you could see the different pre-comps I did for like the shoulders, uh, the neck and the back, just to lower my number of layers. Hello Tyler, good evening to you. Um, the beginning was just recap and you'll be able to see that on the video that I upload tomorrow. All right, now the next step, 
is where the new stuff comes in. So I'm going to keep this up in the background and we'll come back to it. So you can see the totality of everything and how I parented it all together. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to make a new comp. And I'm going to grab a new image. All right. And I'm going to bring them in just by double clicking my project or going, you know, import file import. And here is Mr. Yoga. So I'm going to go layer new null. And I'm going to move that because I don't want to see that. Put it right here. Should sure, actually be at his it'd be at his hip. I'll call this one hip by hitting the space bar. I mean enter key. I'm gonna add another one. New null. I right click to get that. Because there's empty space here. And I'm gonna call this one knee. And no Monty Python jokes about that. Boy, I really hear that bird this time. Okay, I'll put that at the knee. And then lastly, I'll just duplicate this null and I'll call it uh, ankle. I'm only going to do three nulls for this demonstration so I don't bore you all to tears because character rigging can take a very, very long time. All right. So... These are where the body would be bending. And I placed a null at each one and I named each null so I know what it is going to be doing. Are there any questions on that so far? Okay, looks like no questions so far. Don't forget to save frequently, save often. I'm going to next put a pin at each one of these uh, nulls right here at the corner where it was. And then I'll put a pin Oh wait, that put the pin on the actual null. So I'm gonna select the layer, there we go. So I've got the image selected, not my null. That was an accident right there. And then we're going to be using this expression that is in the slides that I gave everybody. And what it does is I'm going to paste this into each null and the stopwatch for the position of the null. It's going to be N and then right here in quotes, whatever you name this. So if I named it hip, I would put hip here. So I'm going to copy this and then you change it for each pin. So I am going to select this pin and look for it. Here it is right here, selected right there. I'm going to right click and rename it. And that is the hip. Just so I know that I'm going to alt click alt or option in the position for that paste in my expression. And I named that one hip. It's got to be spelled exactly the same. You see it reaching out for it right there. Boom. This pin is the knee. You see it light up right there. So I'm going to right click, rename that. I named it right there. It's got to match. I'm going to alt or option click in that stopwatch. Paste my expression again. Change the part in between the quotes. There it finds my null name right there. Click out of the expression. And lastly, right there, you see it's at the ankle. So I'm going to rename that ankle. And I'm going to alt or option click in there and paste in my expression and change that name right there. Like such. Naming the pins is an extra step, but 
if I come back to this, like, let me show you something. Look at how many knolls I have. These are just the knolls all over the place. There are tons of pins in this figure. You could have pins at each finger parented to a knoll. You can get as deep into this as you want. So that's why I'm just showing you this with three pins and three knolls. But I've got one at the toes, the ball of the foot, the heel. So that way, if he needs to tippy toe, you can tippy toe the ankle, you know, and the rest of them make sense. But it's like, this is why naming things helps keep an organized workflow. That's also the more professional way to work. Okay. So first I put down the knolls. I named them. Then I put down the pins on the actual photograph and I named my pins. Then I parented with that expression, the position of the pin to the knoll. All right. That's the first few steps. The next step is I parent the knolls together. The hip is at the top, so the knee will get parented to the hip and the ankle will get parented to the knee. Now let's test this out. I'm going to grab my knee and I'm going to move it a little bit. See that? The ankle is moving with it. Now, remember, you're not just pinning what you want to move, but what you want to pin down. So I'm going to select my guy. I'm going to pin him down, but I'm not going to name these so that we can watch this work a little bit better. See that? See the foot moving with it? That's because it's parented to the null. And then if I take my ankle and I rotate this. Oops, wait a second. Let's try the knee. Yep, see the leg moving? And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Watch the texture of the person's clothes. It moves with it. Okay. So that's rotating. And there's the position. See that? You can animate this still photo. Place down the pins. Well, first I put down the knolls. Name them. Put down the pins on the image. Name them. Then I parented them to the knolls with that expression that is attached in the slides. And remember, what's here in the quotes must match exactly the name of the knoll it's being parented to. And I'm going to grab my puppet pin tool. Don't forget to show mesh. And you see that the mesh is larger than the person. I could always increase or decrease the mesh. I could increase the density of the mesh. That'll give me uh, more triangles, but it'll slow down my render. And last but not least, don't forget, you've got starch pins that you put where the bones are. And look, see how it's already getting to be less rubbery where the bones would be. See that adding those extra starch pins, you know, you don't need that many, but I'm just showing you how it's changing the way that this works. So let me get rid of the starch pins. Any questions on this new technique I showed you where put down your knolls, name them, put down your pins right where the knolls uh, anchor points are. Then you parent the position of the knolls to each uh, point, parent the position of the pins to where the knolls are. And then you parent the knolls together. You know, hip, the knee is parented to the hip, the ankle's parented to the. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to go to the hip. I'm going to hit rotate. And the knee and the ankle move together with it. So it's going to help keep your character together. And remember, anything with a stopwatch, you can animate when you want. So I can animate from here to there. And then let's say I want to do a kick. So the knee, I'm going to want to animate at a different rotation in a different time because they're parented together, but they're also independent. See, so now the knees come through 
And then I could also, if I wanted to lastly, animate the ankle. And I'll do a position for that one actually. Just for the fun of it. Like that. So each one can move independently and they'll move along with the ones they're parented to. So if you don't have strong illustration skills but you still want to do some character movement, this is a viable option. And you know how it works. Lay down the knolls where you want them, put your pins on the image, name the pins, and then parent each position of that pin to the knoll you want it to go to. And lastly, remember, pin down what you don't want to move as well as what you do want to move. You can see what I named the knolls, where the pins are, the order I parented things together. Working with a larger, more complex character with more parts, the head is parented to the neck, the neck is parented to the upper torso, the shoulders are parented to the torso, the middle of the chest, then there's one by the belly button, the hips are parented to the torso, the knees are parented to the hips, the ankles parented to the knee, the heel of the foot is parented to the ankle, the ball of the foot is parented to the um, heel, the toe is parented to there, and then you just work your way down. Like, you know, the fingers are parented to the hand, the hand's parented to the wrist, the wrist is parented to the elbow, the elbow's parented to the shoulder. Make sure you name everything. Don't go, well, I mean, the easiest way to work is go arm, right, arm, left, so that you could look down your giant layer stack and say, okay, my arms, they all begin with the name arm and then the side of the body they're on. It'll make working a lot easier rather than going right arm, left arm. And you can puppet pin hair, make hair move around, however you want to make things go. Just real fast, before I completely close the book on puppet pins, remember, with this character, we put starch pins so you don't have this noodly type of animation if you don't want the noodly type of animation. But when you do want a noodly animation, like for the tentacle, then you don't have to worry about your starch pins. Like that, see? And then it'll move the same. This is for snakes, tentacles, hair, things that don't have bones in them. And last thing I'm going to say, I want you all to notice each one of these tentacles has its own layer. And that's to give me more control as an animator. Like this one right over, right next to the first one I clicked on right here. If I click on here and then I move these pins it's not going to distort this other layer because the pins are only affecting the layer that they're attached to. And also doing this, you see, I don't have to worry about pinning down everything else because this is on its own layer. These are all things to consider when you're choosing how you want to animate. Sometimes more layers, like I said, gives you more options and a cleaner, easier, less destructive workflow. All right, so that's puppet pinning over and done with. I'm going to give a refresher on look at this, edit that, because we're going to use it for learning compound effects. You've started to work with compound effects before, and actually, Carmen, this touches back on your project again when we are talking about fire. I'm just going to draw my little flame here, boom, and the shape isn't all that important. So there's my shape, I'm going to call it fire. And we used a displacement map, 30, not bad. Um, oh, you know what, actually, you'll like this one. So this isn't part of the slides, but like I said, it's going to be in this tutorial. This shows you all the different layers you've got and the numbers. So when you're parenting and you want to make sure you're parenting to the right thing, like, like pretend I've got like five fingers and it's like um, right finger, index finger, you know, right hand index finger, whatever. 
and you don't want to keep track of all that, you can use the numbers and say, oh, I want to parent this to layer eight. And there's your layer numbers right there. So it's a good way of keeping track of things as well as knowing you're putting the right effect on the right layer. So definitely take a look at your layer numbers when you're linking things together. It'll definitely help you out. All right, so, and then we put the fractal noise, we animate the fractal noise, and we use that fractal noise as a displacement map. And that was your first introduction to somewhat of a compound effect. This one is far more complex, so we're going to do just this for the rest of the night. Look at this, edit that. Let me undo the flame, and I'm going to put a new layer here. I'll make it a new solid. I'll call it fractal. And I'll put my fractal noise on it. All right, and there's my noise. All right, now remember, pre-compose helps you with a lot of problems down the road. Fractal pre-comp. Always click move all attributes to a new composition because then all your keyframes will be there and it'll make your life a lot easier so that things don't go awry. Okay, so lastly was the displacement map on the actual artwork. And there's my displacement map on it. And for the, let me zoom in. Where'd my magnifier go? Here we go. All right, displacement map layer, I'm going to choose Fractal PC. Again, this is why you name your layers. It just makes your life a lot easier. And we could already see if I click right here, let me zoom in a little bit. This will hide the edges. This just hides paths and masks. Click it on and off as you need to. And we could already see it starting to distress the shape like that and we go oh well you know that's not quite the look I'm going for so what you do you double click on the fractal here's my fractal I click on the layer and now I can see the effect and you just simply click right here on the little lock like that to lock the effect so when I go back here to my main animation, you see my effect is still here. So I can focus on how it is changing the effect without having to go back and forth. I can see a live preview of it until I get the look I'm looking for. Well, I should say I get the... And remember, a huge help is the scale of your fractal. If I make it small, I'll have tiny little flakes coming off. If I make it larger, I get a more smooth organic type of look. So think about the scale of your fractal as well. Yeah, of course it's possible to merge layers in After Effects. What you do is, and yes, I said water because that's how it's pronounced. So I've got a square and I've got a star. They're two different layers. All I have to do is just Select those two layers and pre-compose them. And that's how you merge layers together. You use your pre-comp, pre-compose. That was just a refresher on look at this, edit that. Now we're going to dive into compound effects. A compound effect is one effect that refers to or takes values from another layer in your composition. So this fractal is driving the displacement map. So the displacement is based off of the fractal. That's what's driving the one effect. The one I'm going to show you is two effects. One's called Wave World, the other one's called Caustics. And they work together to create a unified type of look. Actually, I'll make a new comp. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this one Main Animation so I don't confuse myself. Now I'm going to need two solids. So I'm going to start off by going, clicking my timeline and going layer, new solid. 
I've already, uh, the first one I'm gonna call uh, Wave World. I'm gonna duplicate that by hitting Command D and I'm gonna call the top one Caustics. And you see when I double clicked on my layer, it opened up the uh, layer over here. I don't want that. I wanna be in my comp view. So it's just two shape layers, Wave World and Caustics is what I named them. And I'm gonna pre-compose the bottom layer, Wave World, and I'll just call it Wave World PC for pre-comp and move all attributes into a new layer. All right, there we go. Wave World is pretty good at like, if you want like logos underwater or images underwater or reflections of things, uh, it's just a nice way of displacing and distorting things. You'll see, once you see what the effect does, you'll say, oh, okay, I, I've, I've got some ideas of things I could use it for. Um, and you could put images to use as the reflection. You could put logos beneath, like I said, tons of uh, possibilities. You can put um, skies, you can put video clips in to reflect on the uh, water surface. And it's lots of play and possibility. I'm just showing you the most basic uh, version of it tonight. Okay, so I'm going to open this up, take a look, and I've got to apply the wave world effect here. And you can see that this works off of 3D space. If you do not have a fast computer, you can always change your resolution. This is where you change your resolution right here. I'm going to drop it down to a quarter just so my machine works faster. And as I've said a billion times over, if you need some space, and you should do this every time after you're done working, go edit, purge, all memory, and disk cache. And there's the beginning of the wave world effect. So let's take a look at some of the effects in here that I already started to adjust. See how the top layer moved up a little bit. That's, I think, where the light is reflecting off the surface. Contrast. See how it moved down there. Gamma adjustment. Gamma, I believe, is the midtones of the image. Now check this area out right here. Render dry area as transparent. This way, if you've got like a logo underneath there, you have the ripply wave type of effect and the light shimmering with that underneath being distorted and it's pretty slick. All right, so then I went down to simulation, wave speed. Okay, obviously that's how fast the wave is moving. I slowed it down because I didn't want it moving too fast. See right now I've got a little bit more calm of a look to the waves than that giant distortion we had earlier. Damping, that is, you know, suppressing the movement of it. Almost like the resistance in the particle world effect. See, a little bit more smooth and relaxing. Cause that's the look I'm going for. I don't want like choppy, chaotic seas. Reflect edges, all, pre-roll. That's like how much it's moving before the thing starts. Ground, I think that's what your logo would be. So let's try, here he is. All right, so I'm gonna put this here. I'll pre-compose it just so that there's a less chance of something going wrong. I'll call it yoga or yogi, because I think that's what someone who does yoga is called. Or, no, it's not. You know, forget I said that. And I don't want to see anything in the uh, comment section when I post this. Because I don't do yoga. Alright, so ground. We'll do yogi. And see how that's affecting the ground. I think it's the tonal values of them. So that's what... Uh, see that? So that would be how deep or shallow the water is and it's using the yogi, yogarian. There we go. Or it could be yogava gaba. I think that's actually the right term, if last I checked. And I'm usually right. So we're going to mess around with that ground and see if it's good. We could always just hit none in this little drop down if it's not doing what we want to do. It's then producer. You could do ring, you could do line. Line would be like the edge of a wave coming in. I'm going to switch mine to line. 
See how that changed the distortion on the mesh? And don't forget with these crosshairs, you could always click once and then anywhere you want rather than try and figure out the XY coordinates. And as you see here, remember anything with the stopwatch can be animated. Uh, let's see, wave length. I'm gonna make my wave, oop, there it is right there. I'm gonna make it a little shorter. Let's try the width. Let me see, so I'm here at the line. Length, 1.8. Let's try 0.7. And I'm just putting these numbers in randomly. I chose them a while ago. They might not look that good, but you know, I'm just showing you some of the settings I did change. Amplitude is how high the waves are coming up off the surface. Frequency, how much they're moving. And then you've got phase. Now there's two producers. The producer is what's driving the effect. See it right there? That little ball that's moving around. That's the producer. So if you want a second one, like say there was another object causing the waves, you would just alter your second producer right there. All right, so that's, a, let me hide the Yogi image. And we might, we'll see if we want him being that steep and distorting it. Like just the value. See, that's the shape he made. So that's the ground coming up, poking into the water. All right, and then Monday we'll wrap up the second half of this with caustics. And I'll show you how the wave world drives the caustics. And then we're going to start lab. Uh, we're going to take a quick break so I can refill my water. And if you need to, you can grab a quick snack. I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, I see what you got here. There's a mountain and a landscape and you move in on the mountain and then there's someone meditating just sitting down and you see sweat on their face and then the title fades in and the, the eye opens and the title fades in um okay uh this is the same thing as with your first animation uh you've got every element in this doesn't move like mountains don't move the ground doesn't move the trees don't move it's going to be very uh, limited um, even if you're moving the camera in the character is sitting there meditating not moving so uh, I'd be careful of it and see what you can do but you know it's like I said, you've got four or five elements in this image that don't move. So I'm going to give a quick recap on parallax. Yeah, I, I get the idea. But what I'm saying is you have a lot of elements. Like if you would, uh, let's say you had animals moving around. That's great because then you could have, you know, lizards scuttling across the desert, birds flying through. That's a way to push it. You've got some life in the scene. So for each element you want to add into it, uh, let me turn off alpha. We'll do full resolution. Okay, parallax, again, as I said, is a bunch of layers stepped out in Z space. So I'm going to make each one of these their own color. There, I'm deselecting so that it stays its own. I'm going to make an oval there. Okay, I'm just doing basic shapes so that we can go over this concept quicker than me drawing out something beautiful and cool looking. All right, here we go. The shapes are basically set up like this. All right, now what we've got here is a traditional 2D workspace. All right. Now, these are my switches. Remember, here's toggle switches and modes down here at the bottom. These are my modes. You want to be in your switches. And for each layer that's going to have the parallax effect, you want to click the 3D cube right there. So here's my layer. And here's the 3D cube I clicked. And again, here's toggle switches and modes. These are modes. This is for doing blending modes and setting up mats. And these are your switches. So you want to be in your switches and you want to click the 3D enable 
for each layer that you want to be in your parallax. So now I have a two and a half D workspace. I'm going to make this one not 3D just to show you the difference. I select all my layers. Remember your four pillars of motion design are position, scale, rotation, and transparency. Parallax takes place across Z space, which is position. I'm gonna zoom back in. And here is the difference. The ones that are 3D enabled have X side to side, Y up and down, and then Z forward and back in space. The ones that are not with the 3D enabled in the switch column are just X side to side and Y up and down. They cannot go forward and back in time. Once you click the cube to 3D enable it, now you get Z space. Remember parallax, you need these stepped out in Z space. So the star in the background, let me click the star. Yeah, there's the star. If I give it a positive number, it's, yep, okay, good. And then you got your cubes, click for the layers. So if I give it a positive number, it's going further away from the camera. Okay, I'm just gonna do 6,000. And then this one right here, I'm gonna keep it zero. And then this one right here, I'm gonna make it negative 6,000. And it's so far back, you can't see it anymore. I need to put a camera in the scene. I'm gonna go layer new, camera, and the camera is what's gonna enable the parallax. We'll give it a wide lens just so I can see a bit of the shape. The camera tool is right up here, right next to the pan behind, which you use for moving your anchor points. And you see there are four different cameras. You can access them by hitting the C key to switch through them. Okay. I'll show you what each one does in a second. The first camera, the orbit camera, you can see you can swing it completely around like you had a giant camera on your shoulder. Hit C again, orbit, and if I hold down shift, now it's only going to orbit around on one axis. This is the X axis going from side to side. I mean the Y axis. This would be the X axis going up and down. So that's, you know, think of it like a tie and someone grabs your tie and starts running around you or like a ball spinning around a maypole, a like tether ball. Then I'm going to hit the C key again. And this camera is the pan side to side. I held down shift for that. I hold down shift and you can go up and down. That's to move the camera side to side or up and down. Here's the one we want. Lastly, the Z, the zoom in and out camera. Now we can see that first shape because it went so far beyond the camera. And you see how the circle in the front moves much faster than the other shapes. The images closest to the camera move fastest. The ones furthest, furthest away from the camera will move the slowest. Okay? That's the relation between these shapes with parallax. Have them pushed very far away and it'll give a lot of depth to your shot. So no matter how you have your camera moving, everything in the shot will be moving at a different speed and give that bit of realism to it. That's the first bit. Spread them out in Z space. Put your camera in. Make sure you can see everything. Now, to move your camera through time, you can use your zoom. See how I'm zooming in and out? So what I'll do, I'll zoom out a little bit. I'm going to click my stopwatch. So I'm zooming across in time. And then under transform, that's where you can animate the position and the point of interest. The point of interest is what the camera's pointed at and the position is the physical location on X, Y, and Z. So I just click those stopwatches because I'm not sure where I'm going to want to end up. And then I just move forward in time. So let's just say five seconds. And I want to zoom in. So this direction is zoom in. If I make the number smaller, I'm zooming out. So I want the number to be larger so that I can zoom in. And I just keep zooming until I get to the amount that I want to be at. Remember the least, the, the lower the number of keyframes you have in your camera, the smoother the movement. And you're going to ease all your keyframes once you're done. Let's try 15,000. Let's try 25,000. Okay, that's about right. And then let's go up here to the position. 
I'm going to move the camera a little bit and you see how the image in the background is moving as well. And you could also animate the point of interest if you wanted to. So if I select my camera and hit the U key, that'll just leave my keyframes, which I can then, you know, either marquee drag around or just click the word for each layer and hold down shift to get them all. Remember, if you click the stopwatch, you lose all your keyframes. You don't want to click the stopwatch again. You can click the word or you can marquee drag. Going to hover over one of them, right click, keyframe assistant, easy ease. So now my keyframes are eased and I will adjust my render bar right here at the end of my timeline. Deselect everything, scrub back to the beginning and hit the spacebar to preview the animation. There you are moving through space and time as well as coming in and out of what used to be a flat scene. Okay, that's parallax in a nutshell. You could put 3D particle systems in there. The star could be the sky in the background with the clouds. The red shape could be the mountains. The blue could be trees in front of it. The ground, you're going to have to have an image that like stretches really far back in Z space. I'll show you what I mean, I mean by that. One sec, let me zoom out. All right, I'm going to add a new shape. So I'm going to rename that just so I see what's what. Here's my star. Here's my square. And then this would have to be the circle. So let's pretend you've actually got a scene. I'm going to do the rectangle tool. And just for the fun of it, I'm going to make it brown so it's like a ground. Make a nice big image. Put that below my camera. I'm going to call this ground. Now, if I keep this just 2D, it's not going to be affected by the camera. I've got to go 3D enable it by clicking right there. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it. So X is side to side on this angle right here. And I'm going to move my anchor point right there. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'll hold down command or control to snap it. I'll snap it to the middle right there see the X is making it go like I want it to as if it were ground. Now I'm going to use my arrow select tool. The Z right here is going to move it up and down because I rotated it. Y you can move over each one of these to constrain it to that axis. See this is moving it side to side. This one's moving it up and down and this one will move it closer or further from the camera. I'm going to scale this up a whole lot. And I'm going to move it down and I need to scale it even more. So, so, yep, that's going to scale it off into the ground distance. So as the camera is flying through, see the ground still moves with it. It's got to be large enough to fill that horizon up as the camera moves. So it's got to be as wide as the widest that the camera is. So now we've got a ground and there's all your shapes. So just for the fun of it, let's just throw a fractal noise on the ground to give it some interest so that we could see what we're moving through in space and time. And we'll change the size of that fractal. We'll make it much larger. There we go. Just have a little bit of interest to it. Now we'll do tint. Throwing a tint on here, I can then change what's white to something more brownish to colorize that texture and still keep the tonal value. That's what tint does. Fill just throws a solid color on there. Tint helps keep some of the tonal value. So now we've got a little bit of a nice little texture going on. And you notice the texture does not scale with this as the camera moves. So I'm going to hide that texture and you see the ground behaving properly. You can also add lights into the scene if you wanted shadows to react. 
here's a tree. Make it Z space enabled. Put it where I want to put it. Scale it up to whatever size I want. But first, got to move that anchor point. Put it at the bottom because trees grow from the bottom. Like that. I can put a line of trees in here as well. Make that 3D. Put them wherever I want them. And then you see how the Z space is very important for these trees and where they are based upon where the camera's going. So the camera would need to push through those trees further or I'd have to move them closer so that the camera goes past them. So I would need to move my camera out more to see them in the beginning shot. But you see how just something sitting still there, like a mountain, or a tree, or the sky, it's you're going to have camera movement, but there's not going to be a lot of stuff there. You should have a particle system with some dust blowing across the prairie, animals crawling across it, uh, maybe some water with a reflection in it, trees casting shadows, birds flying around, like lots of stuff to add some interest to this otherwise bland unmoving scene okay well a lot more than birds going on particles things like that try and fill that space up and even like little rock piles that you go by the more things you have that the camera's passing through the more interest you'll get or a dust cloud tumbleweeds going across the prairie that's a good one too you know Whatever you can think of. reading Danielle's question right now okay and there's the stopwatch okay so if you want this to shake a little bit the easy thing for that would be a wiggle expression and a slider we'll go up and down while the whole stopwatch will shake okay that's a bit more direction I'm just throwing this on real fast to uh, give it some alpha around it. Okay, not bad. That's a little bit more usable. All right. So, here's your stopwatch. First off, the button I would have on its own layer. Um, here's the stopwatch. So, the wiggle with the slider effect. The way that works is we'll just do it on the position. And I'm going to make a null. We'll try putting the expression for the slider in a null. We'll see if that works. So, this is experimental territory, but it should work. So first goes the wiggle expression on the position. So I, you know, P for the position, Alt or Option click. There's wiggle. Let's try um, twice a second, comma, 130. Click out of the expression. Let's change it to 80. And then see what that's like. That's a little better. That's why you gotta make sure you click out of it. 
All right, that's a little better. All right, so for this null, let's put a slider in there. Okay, oop, I want that on the null. All right, good. So let's try the first value. There we go, okay. So what I did, I'm gonna undo that for you and I'm gonna go slower. I knew we'd figure it out. Like I said, motion design, it's 85% mental and then the rest of it is the, the drudge of getting everything to work. So you're gonna have your clock, you could have, okay, great. You could have everything pre-composed inside here and still be able to edit everything individually within that pre-comp. So here's your pre-comped artwork. And what you're gonna do, with your wiggle expression, you're going to highlight the first number whenever you like what you see. Then you're going to pick whip to the slider right here where it says the word slider on that null that we put. Again, I got the slider from over here. I just typed in slider and threw it on there. Zero is off, one is on. So if we wanted to start shaking at the two second mark, I click my slider and I go forward to however many frames and I change it to one. No wiggle. Then it's going to build up to here. It's going to keep wiggling until we want it to stop. So I click the diamond here to create a keyframe for when I want it to start stopping. And one more diamond and I set that back to zero to turn it off. So it's zero, one, one, zero. Just like like that. So does this make sense with the wiggle and then parenting it to a slider so that you can have it start to wiggle when you want and then stop wiggling when you want. And another thing you could do if there's someone here and they've got a hand, this is again, like I said, hands are my specialty. You're very lucky you get to watch me draw some hands tonight. And I spent a lot of time working on them, so I hope you all appreciate that. So there's my hand. If I parent this hand to the stopwatch, the hand will shake with it, and then I can go in when I want, where my keyframes are at, here, and then animate the hand to click the stop by either using puppet pins or animating the path such click like that would look weird if they make a hand holding the stopwatch that is up to you but you know I showed you like I mean obviously you would draw the hand a lot faster but just that simple little motion really helps sell this um, but that is your call I think it would look better with the hand holding it Obviously a hand drawn anatomically correctly would look even better. See that? Boom. That's not half bad. And that was like only a few minutes worth of work. Okay, I see what you're saying. Morph it. Interesting. Uh, all right, let's play around with that idea. I'll make a new pre-comp. Let's get rid of this other stuff. And Carmen, don't forget what I told you earlier. You know, parent the hand to the null so that you can rotate the hands as you need to based off of the wrist null. See, cause then they can not only rotate, but move along with the hand. Now this is amazing. That's going straight into my portfolio. All right, so I'll make a new sequence. Okay. And we'll pretend that this is a drawn stopwatch. All right, and it's just standing still. So if you want this to turn into something, um, you'd have to figure out how you want that to happen. Like if legs and uh, like treat it like a character, will it be humanoid? Uh, no, just like a torso, uh, two arms, two legs, you know, doesn't need to have a face. It already has a face right here and make sure the whole thing fits as you want it to fit. So let's pretend this is 
going to be its full height from the head. We'll pretend I drew a torso out for it. And then we'll pretend that it's got limbs that sure um that's up to you i'm going to give you a quick example of what you're talking about and showing you the work involved uh, so first off if it's going to be a character you're going to want to rig your character round edges will always help this is going to be the forearm such and I'm gonna want my anchor point where it's gonna oops you hold down control or command to snap it okay let's take a look at that good and then we'll have the arm and we're gonna move the anchor point for that hold down command or control put it right there okay fine and then I'll move the torso down a little bit And I'm going to put my torso anchor point at the bottom because it would be moving off of where the hips are. There's my forearm, there's my arm, there's my torso. I'm going to parent my arm to the torso and my forearm to the arm. That way, if I rotate the arm, the forearm moves with it. All right? Let us take a look at this animation now. All right, let's say it's going to be a two second morph. All right, and this is where we want to end up. So I'm going to, oh, last thing I forgot is the stopwatch is going to get parented to the torso. All right, all right, you know what? Let's try something different let's get rid of that and instead I'm going to do a path with no fill all right like I said I'm just making this up as I go along I'm just showing you some possibilities here okay we'll pretend and obviously I want some roundness going on there so I'm going to go to my stroke and I'm going to do round so now I've got more of a body, all right? And you're gonna love this. These I could work off of with strokes or shapes, but the reason I chose the body to be the shape, I mean this line, let's call it torso, is because of this. You ready for this? So. I've got my path and I'm going to want this to grow upwards. So I've got my, turn off my keyframe. I've got my path selected and I'm going to go window, create knolls from paths. Points follow knolls. All right, you ready for this? So I've got a knoll at the top and I've got a knoll at the bottom. Let's see which is which. This is the one at the bottom. So I'll call this hips. I'll call this one shoulders. Boom. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the clock at the top. So it's the head. And watch this. You ready for this? I'm going to parent the clock to the shoulders. No. And then, if I move the position of that null, I can have the clock grow up as well as the body coming out of it like such so I would just say I want it to be that tall at the end click there move down to where I want it to begin boom and I could even see what it looks like if I move the clock down independently so it looks like it's lifting its head up move this a little bit further. I'll move that there and I'll move this. Oops. 
So it lifts its head up, then the body grows, because now it's parented together. And then what I could do is have the arms swing out from once the body starts to grow, like say right about here. So you don't need to see them. We'll pretend they're behind the back. And then what I'm going to do is the arm. I'm going to hit R for rotate. I'll move that behind the back. And then the forearm, I'm going to rotate that so it's behind the back. So here he starts springing up. And I'm going to rotate these out as I need to. Say about here. Then this one's going to come out like that. And then this one's going to come out like that. And obviously, remember, ease all your keyframes. Let's take a look at that. So this is an example of starting to morph some shapes and thinking about what you want them to do. Like, I parented this to the knolls so that the body can grow and still keep the head together with it. And then you could have the arms swing out, you know, whenever you want as it's growing up. Like if you want them to come out earlier, you would just simply move these keyframes earlier to give it a slower, more menacing type of animation. But you see, it's not quite lining up at the top. So let's try this. My forearm. I'm going to parent, well, the arm, that's what I want, the arm. I'm going to parent to the shoulders. And let me move these down a little bit. Oops, sorry about that. Let's move the arm in this position down a little bit. There we go. Perfect. So let's take a look. Now it's moving along with it. Great. And the forearm is a little too long. So I'm going to fix that animation. So it's hidden, swinging out that way. I could even wait until here and change the endpoint for that layer. Oh wait, that's the arm, not the forearm. Here's the forearm. Okay. Like such. So animation hierarchy, think about what's coming in, when it's coming in, how it's coming in. If this thing has six arms, like an insect, you could have them each swing out at their own time as you want them. Move your anchor points before your keyframe. Think about the motion you want. I knew I wanted the forearm to be connected where the elbow would be and the arm to be connected where the shoulder would be. The arm... I connect it to the null, that's the shoulders, so that as the shoulders move up, the arm moves with them, and the head, which is the alarm clock, is parented to the top of the shoulders as well, so you have the creature growing. And then if I wanted, I could duplicate these and make legs and have it stand up even taller, and, you know, stuff like that. So that's just a little bit of an idea. Uh, showing you how you can take a shape and create something else out of it. Hope that helped a little bit. But I think it's a pretty neat idea. Or check have the arm Oh wait, I didn't have rotation. That's why, because I was working on position. Click have the arm turn itself off, like such. Both will work. I'm gonna take a look, one second. That's one, and then here is the finger, the thumb clicking it off. Both work, it's all a matter of how you want to drive your animation. Opening up the mail now. You could also import other After Effects files into the one you're working on if you want to keep things together. 
I'm just importing five files. Okay, so now let's give it a try. Because I put the artwork together and we'll see if that keeps everything the way it should be. Great. Okay. See what you're doing there. Good. Hmm. All right. Let me go back to the chat now that I've got the files. Okay. Got it. Obviously, as you can see. Good job. You continuously rasterized. Hmm. Okay. Uh... Let's take the rings. Okay, now, if you moved your anchor point to the bottom before you keyframed, uh, it's... then it's going to have more of a depress to it. And. One, two, so down there, then back up. All right, I think you've got an extra keyframe here. So let's try what happens with this and then go over here and yeah, okay. Back up. This might be an extra keyframe we don't need. Let's see what that looks like. Uh, okay, have a good weekend. Stay safe. Okay, so what do you think of that, Danielle, getting rid of that second keyframe? So it's, there's the motion down. And then back up. Okay. Yeah, there was one extra keyframe in the scale and the rotation. I moved the anchor point to the bottom because, you know, that's where it should be because it's, you wanted to get that little bit of the squash and you get that squash because you already have your non-uniform scale, which is right. So just watch your anchor point. Once I got drink some more water, here's where the rotating is right there. Yep. Okay. So you did that manually. Let's take a look. Nice. Um, good job with the overshooting. Just a reminder, you could use the inertial bounce um, expression and save yourself some time in the future. And plus, it'd be a lot easier to edit should you need to. I'll show you what the difference is with that. Let me duplicate this. Hide the original. Zoom in a little bit. It's okay, so we get rid of these. Like I said, this way there's just going to be less keyframes. Let's try this. So for this expression, you have to have your keyframes so it knows what to overshoot. So I'm going to keep the keyframes. Option click in the stopwatch, paste it in. Let's see if that did it. Yep. All right, and it's a lot longer. To make these longer, I just move the playhead and then I'm going to option and then click the bracket near the P, not the one right next to the P, but the one next to that to change the out point. So I've got a little bit more of that artwork for the overshooting. And then I just adjust the amount, like the decay. Let's see if we make the decay lower, if that's going to give it more overshooting.
Let's increase the frequency of it and the amplitude. It's all about um, how much personality you want to give it. And you just adjust those amounts, the amplitude, frequency, and decay up at the top. Try, you know, larger numbers. And if the large is going in the wrong direction, make it a smaller number. It's just a matter of experimenting. That's all After Effects is, is experimenting and trying different things. Saving frequently, save as, so you've got something to go back to. And just trying to work non-destructively. Any other questions? Could you please send the file back to me? It looks just... Oh! Um, bu -bu -bu -bum. Yeah, no problem at all. And anyone that has questions, send me your files. I can help you, you know, talk you through them, do some mock-ups of things that can help, and then send you the file back. No problem. I, I appreciate you trying to get the most out of the class time and the lab time, asking questions, and, you know, just being a great, attentive student. So... Yep, I'll send that right after I'm done uh, streaming this. Any other questions before I head out? Yeah, no problem at all, Danielle. Uh, you have a great night, a good weekend. Stay safe, uh, careful at work. Questions? Have a great weekend. Stay safe, everybody. And uh, I will see you all Monday, 6 to 8.30 Eastern Standard Time on the channel.